Section 12 of Inca Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Inca Lands by Hiram Bingham. Chapter 7. Part 1. The Valley of the Huatane. The valley of the Huatane is one of many valleys tributary to the Urubamba. It differs from them in having more arable land located under climatic conditions favorable for the raising of the food crops of the ancient Peruvians. Containing an area estimated at less than 160 square miles, it was the heart of the greatest empire that South America has ever seen. It is still intensively cultivated the home of a large percentage of the people of this part of Peru. The Huatane itself sometimes meanders through the valley in a natural manner, but at other times is seen to be confined within carefully built stone walls constructed by prehistoric agriculturists anxious to save their fields from floods and erosion. The climate is temperate. Extreme cold is unknown. Water freezes in the lowlands during the dry winter season in June and July, and frost may occur any night in the year above 13,000 feet, but in general the climate may be said to be neither warm nor cold. This rich valley was apportioned by the Spanish conquerors to soldiers who were granted large estates as well as the labor of the Indians living on them. This method still prevails, and one may occasionally meet on the road wealthy landowners on their way to and from town. Although mules are essentially the most reliable saddle animals for work in the Andes, these landholders usually prefer horses, which are larger and faster, as well as being more gentle and better gaited. The gentry of the Huatane Valley prefer a deep-seated saddle, over which is laid a heavy sheepskin or thick fur mat. The fashionable stirrups are pyramidal in shape, made of wood decorated with silver bands. Owing to the steepness of the roads, a crupper is considered necessary and is usually decorated with a broad embossed panel, from which hang little trappings reminiscent of medieval harness. The bridle is usually made of carefully braided leather, decorated with silver and frequently furnished with an embossed leather eye shade or blinder to indicate that the horse is high spirited. This eye shade, which may be pulled down so as to blind both eyes completely, is more useful than a hitching post in persuading the horse to stand still. The valley of the Huatane River is divided into three parts the basins of Lucre, Oropesa, and Cusco. The basaltic cliffs near Oropesa divide the Lucre Basin from the Oropesa Basin. The pass at Angostura, or the Narrows, is a natural gateway between the Oropesa Basin and the Cusco Basin. Each basin contains interesting ruins. In the Lucre Basin, the most interesting are those of Rumicolca and Piquiacta. At the extreme eastern end of the valley, on top of the pass which leads to the Vilcanota, is an ancient gateway called Rumi Colca, Rumi stone, Colca granary. It is commonly supposed that this was an Inca fortress, intended to separate the chiefs of Cusco from those of Vilcanota. It is now locally referred to as a fortaleza. The major part of the wall is well built of rough stones, laid in clay, while the sides of the gateway are faced with carefully cut andesite ashlars of an entirely different style. It is conceivable that some great chieftain built the rough wall in the days when the highlands were split up among many little independent rulers, and that later one of the Incas, no longer needing any fortifications between the Huatane Valley and the Vilcanota Valley, tore down part of the wall and built a fine gateway. The faces of the ashlars are nicely finished, except for several rough bosses or nubbins. They were probably used by the ancient masons in order to secure a better hold when finally adjusting the ashlars with small crowbars. It may have been the intention of the stonemasons to remove these nubbins after the wall was completed. In one of the unfinished structures at Machu Picchu, I noticed similar bosses. The name Stone Granary was probably originally applied to a neighboring edifice now in ruins. 
On the rocky hillside above Rumikolka are the ruins of many ancient terraces and some buildings. Not far from Rumikolka, on the slopes of Mount Pikriakta, are the ruins of an extensive city also called Pikriakta. A large number of its houses have extraordinarily high walls. A high wall outside the city and running north and south was obviously built to protect it from enemies approaching from the Vilcanota Valley. In the other directions, the slopes are so steep as to render a wall unnecessary. The walls are built of fragments of lava rock, with which the slopes of Mount Piquiacta are covered. Cacti and thorny scrub are growing in the ruins, but the volcanic soil is rich enough to attract the attention of agriculturists who come here from neighboring villages to cultivate their crops. The slopes above the city are still extensively cultivated, but without terraces. Wheat and barley are the principal crops. As an illustration of the difficulty of identifying places in ancient Peru, it is worth noting that the gateway, now called Rumicolca, is figured in Squire's Peru as Piquiacta. On the other hand, the ruins of the large city, covering thickly an area nearly a square mile, are called by Squire the great Inca town of Muina, a name also applied to the little lake which lies in the bottom of the Lucre Basin. As Squire came along the road from Rachi, he saw Mount Piquiacta first, then the gateway, then Lake Muina, then the ruins of the city. In each case, the name of the most conspicuous, harmless, natural phenomenon seems to have been applied to ruins by those of whom he inquired. My own experience was different. Dr. Aguilar, a distinguished professor in the University of Cusco, who has a country place in the neighborhood and is very familiar with this region, brought me to this ancient city from the other direction. From him, I learned that the city ruins are called Piquiacta, the name which is also applied to the mountain which lies to the eastward of the ruins and rises 1,200 feet above them. Dr. Aguilar lives near Oropesa. As one comes from Oropesa, Mount Piquiacta is a conspicuous point and is directly in line with the city ruins. Consequently, it would be natural for people viewing it from this direction to give to the ruins the name of the mountain rather than that of the lake. Yet the mountain may be named for the ruins. Piqui means flea. Yacta means town, city, country, district, or territory. Was this the territory of the fleas, or was it Flea Town? And what was its name in the days of the Incas? Was the old name abandoned because it was considered unlucky? Whatever the reason, it is a most extraordinary fact that we have here the evidences of a very large town, possibly pre-Inca, long since abandoned. There are scores of houses and numerous compounds laid out in regular fashion, the streets crossing each other at right angles, the whole covering an area considerably larger than the important town of Ollantaytambo. Not a soul lives here. It is true that across the Vilcanota to the east is a difficult mountainous country culminating in Mount Ausangate, the highest peak in the department. Yet Piquiacta is in the midst of a populous region. To the north lies the thickly settled valley of Pisac and Uke. To the south, the important Vilcanota Valley, with dozens of villages. To the west, the densely populated valley of the Huatane and Cusco itself, the largest city in the highlands of Peru. Thousands of people live within a radius of 20 miles of Piquiacta, and the population is on the increase it is perfectly easy of access and is less than a mile east of the railroad. Yet it is abandonado, desierto, despoblado. Undoubtedly, there was once a large city of great importance. The reason for its being abandoned appears to be the absence of running water. Although Mount Piquiacta is a large mass, nearly five miles long and two miles wide, rising to a point of 2,000 feet above the Huatane and Vilcanota rivers, it has no streams, brooks, or springs. It is an isolated, extinct volcano surrounded by igneous rocks, lavas, andesites, and basalts. How came it that so large a city as Piquiacta could have been built on the slopes of a mountain which has no running streams? 
Has the climate changed so much since those days? If so, how is it that the surrounding region is still the populous part of southern Peru? It is inconceivable that so large a city could have been built and occupied on a plateau 400 feet above the nearest water unless there was some way of providing it other than the arduous one of bringing every drop up the hill on the backs of men and yamas. If there were no places near here better provided with water than this site, one could understand that perhaps its inhabitants were obliged to depend entirely upon water carriers. On the contrary, within a radius of six miles, there are half a dozen unoccupied sites near running streams. Until further studies can be made of this puzzling problem, I believe that the answer lies in the ruins of Rumikolka, which are usually thought of as a fortress. Squire says that this fortress was the southern limit of the dominions of the first Inca. The fortress reaches from the mountain on one side to a high rocky eminence on the other. It is popularly called El Aqueducto, perhaps from some fancied resemblance to an aqueduct, but the name is evidently misapplied. Yet he admits that the cross-section of the wall, diminishing as it does by graduations or steps on both sides, might appear to conflict with the hypothesis of its being a work of defense or fortification if it occupied a different position. He noticed that the top of the wall is throughout of the same level, becomes less in height as it approaches the hills on either hand, and diminishes proportionately in thickness as an aqueduct should do. Yet so possessed was he by the fortress idea that he rejected not only local tradition as expressed in the native name, but even turned his back on the evidence of his own eyes. It seems to me that there is little doubt that instead of the ruins of Rumikolka representing a fortification, we have here the remains of an ancient Azequia, or aqueduct, built by some powerful chieftain to supply the people of Piquiacta with water. A study of the topography of the region shows that the river which rises southwest of the village of Lucre and furnishes water power for its modern textile mills could have been used to supply such an azequia. The water, collected at an elevation of 10,700 feet, could easily have been brought six miles along the southern slopes of the Lucre Basin, around Mount Rumikolka, and across the old road on this aqueduct at an elevation of about 10,600 feet. This would have permitted it to flow through some of the streets of Puquiacta and give the ancient city an adequate supply of water. The slopes of Rumikolka are marked by many ancient terraces. Their upper limit corresponds roughly with the contour along which such an Ezequia would have had to pass. There is, in fact, a distinct line on the hillside which looks as though an Azequia had once passed that way. In the valley back of Lucre are also faint indications of old Azequias. There has been, however, a considerable amount of erosion on the hills, and if, as seems likely, the waterworks have been out of order for several centuries, it is not surprising that all traces of them have disappeared in places. I regret very much that circumstances over which I had no control prevented my making a thorough study of the possibilities of such a theory. It remains for some fortunate future investigator to determine who were the inhabitants of Puquiacta, how they secured their water supply, and why the city was abandoned. Until then, I suggest as a possible working hypothesis that we have at Puquiacta the remains of a pre-Inca city that its chiefs and people cultivated the Lucre Basin and its tributaries, that as a community they were a separate political entity from the people of Cusco, that the ruler of the Cusco people, perhaps an Inca, finally became sufficiently powerful to conquer the people of the Lucre Basin and remove the tribes which had occupied Piquiacta to a distant part of his domain, a system of colonization well known in the history of the Incas, that, after the people who had built and lived in Piquiacta departed, no subsequent dwellers in this region cared to reoccupy the site, and its aqueduct fell into decay. It is easy to believe that at first such a site would have been considered unlucky. Its houses, unfamiliar and unfashionable in design, would have been considered not desirable. 
Their high walls might have been used for a reconstructed city had there been plenty of water available. In any case, the ruins of the Lucre Basin offer a most fascinating problem. In the Oropesa Basin, the most important ruins are those of Tipan, a pleasant, well-watered valley several hundred feet above the village of Quisipicanchi. They include carefully constructed houses of characteristic Inca construction, containing many symmetrically arranged niches with stone lintels. The walls of most of the houses are of rough stones laid in clay. Tipon was probably the residence of the principal chief of the Oropesa Basin. It commands a pleasant view of the village and of the hills to the south, which today are covered with fields of wheat and barley. At Tipon there is a nicely constructed fountain of cut stone. Some of the terraces are extremely well built, with roughly squared blocks fitting tightly together. Access from one terrace to another was obtained by steps made each of a single bonder projecting from the face of the terrace. Few better constructed terrace walls are to be seen anywhere. The terraces are still cultivated by the people of Quispicanchi. No one lives at Tipan now, although little shepherd boys and goatherds frequent the neighborhood. It is more convenient for the agriculturists to live at the edge of their largest fields, which are in the valley bottom, than to climb 500 feet into the narrow valley and occupy the old buildings. Motives of security no longer require a residence here rather than in the open plain. While I was examining the ruins and digging up a few attractive potsherds bearing Inca designs, Dr. Giaseki, the president of the University of Cusco, who had accompanied me, climbed the mountain above Tipon with Dr. Aguilar and reported the presence of a fortification near its summit. My stay at Oropesa was rendered most comfortable and happy by the generous hospitality of Dr. Aguilar, whose finca is between Quispicanchi and Oropesa and commands a charming view of the valley. From the Oropesa Basin, one enters the Cusco Basin through an opening in the sandstone cliffs of Angostura near the modern town of San Geronimo. On the slopes above the south bank of the Hutane, just beyond Angostura, are the ruins of a score or more of gable-roofed houses of characteristic Inca construction. The ancient buildings have doors, windows, and niches in walls of small stones laid in clay, the lintels having been of wood, now decayed. When we asked the name of these ruins, we were told that it was Sela although that is the name of a modern village three miles away, down the Huatane, in the Oropesa Basin. Like Piquillacta, Old Sela has no water supply at present. It is not far from a stream called the Caira, and could easily have been supplied with water by an Aziquia less than two miles in length, brought along the 11,000 feet contour. It looks very much like the case of a village originally placed on the hills for the sake of comparative security and isolation and later abandoned through a desire to enjoy the advantages of living near the great highway in the bottom of the valley, after the Incas had established peace over the highlands. There may be another explanation. It appears from Mr. Cook's studies that the deforestation of the Cusco Basin by the hand of man and modern methods of tillage on unterraced slopes have caused an unusual amount of erosion to occur. Landslides are frequent in the rainy season. Opposite Sela is Mount Picol, whose twin peaks are the most conspicuous feature on the north side of the basin. Waste material from its slopes is causing the rapid growth of a great gravel fan north of the village of San Geronimo. Professor Gregory noticed that the streams traversing the fan are even now engaged in burying ancient fields by transporting gravel from the head of the fan to its lower margin, and that the lower end of the Cusco Basin, where the Huatane hemmed in between the Angostura Narrows, cannot carry away the sediment as fast as it is brought down by its tributaries, is being choked up. If old Sela represents a fortress set here to defend Cusco against old Oropesa, it might very naturally have been abandoned when the rule of the Incas finally spread far over the Andes.
On the other hand, it seems more likely that the people who built Sela were farmers, and that when the lower Cusco Basin was filled up by aggradation due to increased erosion, they abandoned this site for one nearer the arable lands. One may imagine the dismay with which the agricultural residents of these ancient houses saw their beautiful fields at the bottom of the hill, covered in a few days, or even hours, by enormous quantities of coarse gravel brought down from the steep slopes of Picol after some driving rainstorm. It may have been some such catastrophe that led them to take up their residence elsewhere. As a matter of fact, we do not know when it was abandoned. Further investigation might point to its having been deserted when the Spanish village of San Geronimo was founded. However, I believe students of agriculture will agree with me that deforestation, increased erosion, and grading gravel banks probably drove the folk out of Sela. End of section 12. Recording by William Tomko.